there anything in particular you guys want to see? Like anything? Guitars. But it wouldn't go up there. <laughs> so where'd you wind up? Well, on the ground over there. Yeah, the side stage. Yeah. So, that's Brent, by the way. Brent's our monitor engineer. Hi. So, there's the stage. Uh, it's all mic'd up, ready to do a line check, which we're probably going to start doing pretty soon, right? Okay. Was that the keyboard player, the Mars Volta, that he played? Yeah, the Mars Volta. Yeah, oh, okay. Mars Volta. Yeah, cool. That's right. That's right. <laughs> huge fan of it. Ike. Ike. Yeah. Ike Owens. Yeah. Just the bleachers. Just the bleachers. That's really Just interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's different. Yeah. Everything we do is different. <laughs> what? We've done uh, bars, big giant festivals. Uh, theaters, it's all over the map, so it's hard to put together a touring system that will fit in every one of those venues. So it's easier for us to kind of have, you know, if we can be specify it, really specify it, have it put in in a kind of a custom installation. Okay. Music production and engineering, and as piano, I always gravitated more towards keyboards actually than piano, and there was a lot of synths were just coming out, and it was a really exciting time, and I really just grew to like the technical part of the music more than the playing the music part. And uh, even when I was in bands, I was the guy that set up the, the PA and mic stuff. And I just, I just, that's, I actually would never have guessed I was going to wind up doing this when I was, when I was 17 or 18 years old. Like sound, do things change for you in the stadium versus the yeah. side? Well, it's exciting. It's a new venue, you know. It's hey, yeah. It's cool to do many different yeah. venues, Let and some small bars and stadiums One. and theaters and like it's a festival. It's really fun. And did you plan to be doing this for a living? Well, I, that's a tricky question. <laughs> I, well, I was telling you, it was sort of an accident for me. Yeah. yeah, I kind of fall into it. You mm -hmm. know, I was in art school and it, I just discovered, you know, the lighting is a big part of art and photography and just, sure. I don't know, yeah, it's, it's an accident, I guess. Yeah. Sure. Right. We're wondering what the hell, how do we get here? Yeah, how do we get here? It's just a tricky What am question. I doing? Yeah, just, it happens. Hey, hey, hey. All right, so Gigi's programming right now in the sun. I don't know how you do that. Well, it's kind of hard. I got my glasses. <laughs> uh, so we're going to take a trip down, back down and around. It's sort of tricky to get where, where my house is down there. Uh, let's see. All right, here we go. Checked out the list. Greg, are you talking about the base? the base? The aluminum. Base. I should introduce you to Dominic. He can tell you the real story. It's actually it was it's an antique. It was made by I think by Alcoa, like trying to prove like proof of concept. We can make a base out of aluminum. Wow. It didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> it's really it's an interesting sounding base. And if you if you tap on it, it sounds like a steel drum. You know. Uh, so it's it's kind of a one the one and only. I mean, there may be a few. There's some really interesting instruments on the stage. The piano was designed to drop out of a plane into Germany at the end of World War II. Before the war. And this one, I don't think this one actually got dropped. It stayed in the states. And but well, there's times where I wish. <laughs> yes, it's it's uh, parachute ready. Um, and of course, so we had a guy from this, the guy who runs the Steinway Museum came down and tuned the piano one day, and uh, he was horrified because we painted it. And, oh, oh my God! It's like we don't even have one of these. <laughs> this is the truck that's uh, doing the video. The video director working there. Bring all the camera shots here. I got on the screen. Kick. Okay, Leslie.
atmosphere competes. They do a lot of their own effect stuff up on the stage too, so I'm not really spending too many effects. One or two, a few things. So that's that's the EQ on the PA. Just take it. One drop. <laughs> Big chunks out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sometimes they go back in. Uh, uh, sort of like when you get, when you get soft, yeah, soft yeah. plot in there as opposed to reflective seats, you know? It's, like that's, it's actually less than it looks like, also. It's a really, really kind of wide. You can pull 30 dB out if you want it. That's, that's what we did in the PA, so, so just to balance out the, the sound. Yeah. Right? This type of situation. That's done by you. Yeah, I know, if you look at that, you think that's sort of a lot, but it's actually, it's not that much. I mean, those, that, those look like huge chunks, but that's three. Yeah, the look of the scale, yeah. Really, really large scale. So, Brad, what are you recording the show to? Are, are you making a multi-track? Yeah, I have two Joko recorders over oh, yeah. here. So it's just uh, off the direct outs at the right at the front of the, right after the head amp, yeah. uh, straight over to those. So is that 48 channels left or more? 48. Of which we're all actually recording on 44. And are you recording at 48K to lock back to the video? Yeah, I mean, like nine, the 96, the math is better, but it's a, it's actually really not compatible with a lot of other things. And the truth is, it often gets stepped right back down to 48 anyway. Mute the acoustic. You guys, come in here. Let me get out of the way. Have a look. Like broadcast work, and I've done a little. I wouldn't say I've done a lot. There are ten people talking at once. It's really hard. It can be quite frustrating. You kind of have to have two two minds going at once. You know, like listening to what you're being told to do and doing it while you're also doing what you think you should do. <laughs> so when you turn those knobs, a screen shows up, and it shows you a curve of what you're doing. They should eliminate that. You should just turn the knobs until it sounds right. If you do a comparison of the input and the output of a Poltec EQ, nice good old MEQ, and do that thing that makes the drum sound so great, it'll look pretty much like that, is really the truth. But that graphic representation is, it looks like, oh my god, that's crazy, I should not be doing that. But the truth is that was channel one on every SSL from 1970 to 1985. Was that basically that same curve. So it looks awful, but you just gotta use your ears, you know? And I've had that argument with, uh, I think it's a theoretical argument. In the, if in the end it sounds right, that's all it is. I was wondering if it had to do something with like the big reverberant spaces that you're working into and just happened to I think it's just the frequencies that count the most. There's, there's something to that that like that's really that stuff that clouds up arenas and you know larger venues that 300 500 stuff. But I also think that at some point in pop music that be the EQ became the kick drum sound. And that's and that's really that's where we're at. Yeah. Still, you know, that the sound the sound of modern kick drum Part of the sound of modern kick drum is the EQ. I mean, if you want the drawing to look good, you're not going to be doing, you're not going to be doing much EQ. And then uh, live audio, you often don't have the luxury of, oh, we well, just move the mic another three feet from the kick drum, it'll sound great. You can't do that. It'll feed back all night. So you got to get the mic right in there, and then you do what you got to do to make it. I put a little reverb on it actually. Get away with a little bit. There's also the, uh, the YouTube factor. Bands are coming back to you, me with their phone now, saying, hey, look at this, I saw this on YouTube, you can't hear the kick drum. <laughs> it's 
So, you know, a little snap. There you go, now it's the YouTube cake shop. I don't get that from this guy. What I've got going on over there is like what they used to call New York compression. Now they call it parallel bus compression. You guys ever heard of that? It's a good trick. Take all the drums, send them to the left and the right, and also send them to another bus, and you take that bus and you just compress it very hard, very hard, like beyond all reason. You turn it up on its own, you'd think it would sound broken. And you would just add that in to the sort of plain vanilla sounding drums. And what it does is, instead of compressing the peaks, it brings up the valleys. So you are, in effect, compressing the dynamic range of the kick drum, but you're doing it by raising the floor, not by lowering the, you know all the cymbals still have the same crack, the snare drum has the same pop, but you hear little things that you wouldn't have heard. And it's, uh, it's very handy live, because it's hard enough to make everything. And easier uh, in analog, have you, have you changed or modified or run into any issues on a digital console? Yeah, there's because of latency issues. So what the trick to doing that is, you assign it to two sets of buses, and you put the same plugins on both, and you just have one, of, one set of plugins not do anything, just all they do is add exactly the same amount of latency as the other. Uh, first time I tried it, I did it on a, a PM1D, and I used, I um, can't remember what compressor, outboard compressor, it might have been a distru pair of distressors. And I inserted them, and that added uh, an a, to, a D to A and an A to D conversion, which added about three milliseconds or so of delay. So to compensate, I inserted on the other bus two mic cables. <laughs> it just added exactly the same amount of latency to the vanilla one. And I tried it with delay, and I would, no matter what I did, I could never get it spot on. But the, ad, adding two mic cables into the very nice. analog face tape, very silent. You know. <laughs> There's a place for both. Really. Any questions? Uh, just one quick question. Sure. Are you using the uh, voice through those compressors? The, the Manly, the top one, the Manly is uh, electro-optical. So there's a little light in there and that's what triggers the compressor. How, how light, how much, how bright the light is glowing is dependent on what's coming into it and that's what triggers the compressor, so. That's on the vocals? That's on his vocal, exactly. Hey. Go Red Sox! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome.